Uh, in terms of the remaining items on subpart F, there's uh, two areas, one which I'll call special issues and another which is uh, referred to as uh, investment in U.S. property. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I would ask that you look through the slides uh, for these several items. There's a lot of material in the slides. What I want to do, though, is to uh, go through several of these uh, just in, with a uh, picture on the, uh, the overhead projector to try to get across why is it there uh, as opposed to exactly you know, how it, the details of how it works. Now, there's, there's a lot of cases where uh, a U.S. parent will have multiple CFCs, controlled foreign corporations, in other countries. Sometimes for legitimate business reasons, sometimes for just solely tax planning reasons, you know, God forbid, uh, there will be structured various agreements and costs between them. So, for example, between two CFCs, you might see, uh, for example, uh, a loan which causes interest to go back to the other, uh, to the other uh, CFC, CFC 1, CFC 2. You might also, of course, see a, uh, a license of property, uh, intellectual property, and as a result of royalty going back the other way. You might also see the rental of physical property. Uh, could be plant, equipment, uh, anything like that. So the point is that interest, royalty, rental, what does that sound like? Anybody remember the categories of subpart F income? Uh, yes, Jen. The passive. Pardon? The passive income. Passive. Uh, well, the... what's the what's the term for it that we uh, that we see it's that the first one. Foreign, personal. <laughs> foreign personal holding company income? Okay, so if there are. Uh, interest and royalty payments going from CFC 2 to CFC 1, does that mean that CFC 1, to the extent of this interest, royalty, rental, you know, whatever it happens to be, uh, will that cause foreign personal holding company income here within the CFC, uh, here within CFC 1, which, of course, if it is, can cause a subpart F inclusion of income up here. Now, I said before that, uh, that uh, perhaps this license or loan or rental might be for good and valid business reasons, but I also said that it might be solely for tax reasons. What tax reason might there be? Why would we perhaps want an interest charge going from CFC 2 to CFC 1? Okay, so there's a deductible expense in CFC 2 in the country where it is operating, or in its home country if it's, you know, if the country of incorporation, uh, of course, uh, uh, will ta is likely to tax it. So there's a tax deduction. Okay, what about income in CFC1? Do you think this U.S. company at the top chose CFC1 because of its high tax rate or because of its low tax rate? Uh, yes, Darcy? Low tax rate. Low tax rate, shocking. I'm going to take, take all the easy questions. Oh, you're going to take the easy ones. It's pretty smart. 
see Jen, you take the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we divided it up. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> okay. So the point is that that uh, there's an attempt, and you're going to see this through the uh, the uh, the project that you're doing on these various multinationals that you've chosen. You're going to see that the structuring that they've done has had two objectives. One, of course, is to maximize the amount of income outside the United States so that there will be no current US tax. And of course, uh, before the recent Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, maximize the benefit of deferral, which again, we've talked about uh, a few sessions ago. The second objective, though, is that to the extent they've avoided US tax, they also want to avoid foreign tax. Because for every dollar that they pay in foreign tax, that reduces the benefit of deferral. So as a result, they would like to put anything they can in the way of a deductible item against CFC2, which has some business and is earning revenues from conducting a real business, they want to reduce the taxable income in what under whatever foreign country rules they're, they're uh, obligated to pay taxes. They want to reduce their taxable income, have deductions, and then have the income somewhere where it's going to be either taxed at a zero rate or at least a lower rate than what they're uh, what they would pay in, uh, in CFC2. Now, do you think that this is very nice that uh, companies would do this? Well, what do you think, Gary? It's tax planning. It's tax <laughs> planning. It's nice well, not, make a difference. well <laughs> there's, there's two ways to look at this. And I know on one of, one of the slides somewhere I say, you know, do you care, you know, about this issue? And the answer is, if you care about tax policy, yeah, you care. If you are, uh, if you're just, you know, helping your client uh, conduct his business within the environment that all these countries have created, you really don't care. You're just trying to help your client uh, wend its way through all of this a uh, jigsaw puzzle of uh, what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, it's just part of the environment. Uh, you really don't care whether it's right or wrong. Well, the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is that at one point, a lot of this kind of situation would be caught by subpart F and in fact would cause a subpart F inclusion up at the US level. But in, I want to say uh, 2004, five or six, somewhere in there, Congress, uh, uh, presumably being nudged gently by, uh, uh, by uh, US-based multinationals, said, hey, you know, this doesn't hurt the US. Gee, it's better for the in the U.S. If we have a mechanism where we can reduce the tax imposed in CFC2, then you know that sort of helps the U.S. So Congress put in a provision, and this is this uh, 954C6, 954C6, put in a provision which basically said. Do whatever you want in terms of fleecing the taxable income of other countries. So Gary back there, who spent a lot of time in Japan, gee, uh, he probably saw the uh, deduction side of a lot of this sort of thing. Now, interestingly, this uh, 954C6 uh, was brought in as a temporary measure and it has been re-legislated uh, every 
two or three or four or five years since then. And it currently is set to expire uh, at the end of 2019. The, the point is that probably this seemingly innocuous provision is going to find its way into legislation this year or also based on how we've seen it uh, in past years. Uh, perhaps in 2020 it'll be put back in on a retroactive basis so that it continues. But this provision that allows this kind of fleecing of the foreign country, this is something which has been an important part of the uh, uh, subpart F landscape. Because again, what it is, it's an exception which says that the income, the interest, the royalty, the rental, if it meets the qualification, it will be excluded from foreign based company income and therefore will not be immediately taxable back in the United States at the uh, parent level. Okay, uh, anything on this before I go on to the next one? How does that fleece up foreign countries? Uh, well, CFC2 has, uh, has a business. It earns, you know, legitimately, uh, uh, let's say, 100 of uh, gross income and has uh, some expenses, uh, let's say, uh, 20. So it has 80 of income before any interest, royalty, and other payments. Uh, I don't remember how clearly I've said this previously, but one of the realities of the environment that we're in is that you can construct, I mean, you start with a blank sheet of paper. You can construct whatever entities you want in terms of conducting business. You, within a group, can choose uh, how much to put in as equity, how much to put in as debt, what the interest charges are going to be, what intellectual property to either transfer in some fashion, whether as a, uh, in exchange for shares or through sale or through license. You have all these different alternatives as to how you do it, and each one has different results. The whole group, the US company and the two CFCs, they are one centrally managed, commonly owned group of companies. It doesn't matter to the US parent and its shareholders whether a dollar is earned in this one or is earned in this one. It doesn't care. So in a lot of cases, the only factor will be how do we reduce on an overall basis our tax obligations to these various countries, jurisdictions that we're operating in. Does it matter whether I pull this money out of this pocket and put it into this pocket? Or maybe this pocket over here? But I don't know if this is what Jed's getting at, because I was sort of wondering, too. It's kind of up to the foreign country to devise a tax system, isn't it? So that when... Absolutely. Right. No question. But pretty much conceptually, the tax systems around the world are pretty much exactly the same. Now, the specific rules will vary. Uh, what you have to do to uh, be deductible in one country is going to be a little different than in another country for a particular type of item. But conceptually, they are all the same. I mean, I'm not arguing any sort of policy here. But no, please for, go ahead and do so. <laughs> but for the U.S. setting up uh, corporations elsewhere, you're not that country... You know, I guess if you're philosophically saying that the tax system in the U.S. is what it is because of all the great benefits that you get as far as being a U.S. citizen, right? So that's why we say what we say about our taxing system. Yeah, it's a great so, honor to be a taxpayer, and you're getting the benefits of uh, citizenship or residency if you're not a citizen. But I guess you could argue that 
and I'm not arguing, but I guess you could argue <laughs> <laughs> that, if, but for the U.S. setting up those C CFCs where they are, that home country, that foreign country that they set them up for, isn't necessarily generating the intellectual property or the jobs or some of the other pieces of, of you know, that would go with that. So should it get a, a different level of privilege if it really didn't, I, I'm not articulating this very well. No, actually, no, you're, you're articulating something very, that's fundamental with respect to arguments that are going on now in the international community. Uh, I just added something to the uh, uh, current issues page on the website that was issued by the OECD today. Uh, in fact, uh, on uh, the question of countries trying to actually discuss how the pie should be split because of how uh, amazingly easy it is for multinationals to, uh, of course, choose not to put income, uh, or let's say choosing to put it in low tax jurisdictions. Yes, it's a tax policy matter as to how much uh, if we're talking about, uh, for example, uh, intellectual property, uh, a product has been developed in the United States, and that's where the R&D is. And I think you'll see in, uh, again, a lot of these uh, companies that you're doing your project on, you'll see that they've transferred in some manner the rights uh, to that property outside to some CFC somewhere. Maybe CFC1 is where they transferred that, that intangible to. CFC2 pays a royalty for it. And yes, that makes sense. Uh, now, from a US perspective, the US might look at it and say, well, gee, uh, that royalty should have come back to the US. And a lot of the controversies, especially with respect to transfer pricing, get specifically to that. Was the were the intangibles when transferred from the US to CFC1. Um, you know, for example, if you're looking at uh, uh, Microsoft that transferred intangibles to a Puerto Rican subsidiary, well, gee, what's the value of that? Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, the point is in, in the greater the greater scheme that you're talking about, yeah, there's a real question as to how much each country uh, should be able to, to grab. Uh, but within the environment we are in now, where each individual country is treated as a separate legal entity, no, uh, in a sense, except for transfer pricing purposes, which we'll be talking about uh, really next week, uh, except for transfer pricing purposes, we really ignore the fact that all these are commonly owned. We respect the license. We respect the loan. Now, within this environment, uh, we have, for U.S. purposes, the subpart F mechanism, which on the surface would catch this kind of arrangement. But it doesn't because Congress has seen fit to uh, provide an easy mechanism to, for the groups to construct license agreements that will result in better tax results for them, loan agreements, and so on. I guess what I meant to ask is the U.S. is also missing out on tax money. Oh, of course it is, okay. which again is why you know I keep talking about the sledgehammer or the baseball bat that this guilty provision is that we'll eventually be talking about. Okay, the one other thing that I'd like to, uh, to just refer to very quickly, uh, we talked about foreign-based company sales income before, and we, we said that uh, if this is, okay, the U.S. up here, and we have Y down here, and we have customers over here, and uh, if X sells to Y and Y sells to the customers, we said that 
Uh, this might be a vanilla form of foreign base company sales income. In terms of a special issue in this subpart F area, there's a lot of material. Uh, the particular reg section is 1.954-3 uh, that allows an exception where Y conducts manufacturing on the product. In other words, it's not just a simple purchase and resale. There's an exception that if Y actually conducts manufacturing, then uh, it will be uh, uh, respected as not uh, foreign based company sales income. Now, again, I uh, suggest that you page through uh, the slides on that uh, since uh, uh, we won't go into any more detail on that. The look through rule, the um, C6, does that yes. pretty much swallow the whole? Um, foreign personal holding company income? Uh, well, I believe it's stated in uh, C6 that it's specifically for dividends, interest, uh, rental, and royalty. Uh, if, there were, uh, if there were service fees that uh, would constitute foreign-based company services income... Yeah, but that's under E. Uh, well, right. I mean, that's a different uh, a different category. But I think in terms of uh, the usual suspects, that would be the uh, that would cover the waterfront. Uh, presumably, if you had uh, uh, let's say some other categories of subpart F income, where, uh, for example, uh, commo certain commodity transactions or other things, if they happen to involve a related group member, they would not be covered. But it almost swallows. It, it swallows pretty much, I would, I would think in most cases, 99% of, what, uh, of what's important. Now, it does not swallow uh, interest, dividends, rentals, royalties from unrelated parties. Now, there are, <clears throat> there are other exceptions that could apply, but uh, this uh, 954C6 doesn't hit those other ones. I thought sub F was only applying if you're related to begin with. You're thinking for foreign based company sales income and foreign based company services income. Those two, there's always a related person involved. But, this one, but for foreign personal holding company income, has nothing to do with whether the payor is related. Uh, to the recipient of the income, to the CFC that's receiving the income.